a bit about me. My name is Maya. I, um, this slide is a lie. I don't actually work at Linear yet, but I will be starting in three weeks. And they said I could put this on a slide, so it's on a slide. Um, I'm an art school dropout, and I have a degree in game development, which means I've never made a game in my life. And I do front end by day. I do 3D also by day, because at night I am sleeping. These slides are live on my website, so if you want to, you know, speed read them and then take a break, that's fine by me. Um, I do encourage you to look at them because there are a lot of like links and things throughout that might be useful to you. And also there's a lot of code that I really, you know, it's been a long day and I don't necessarily want to go through all of it. So, you know, I'll be skimming it. You can look at it in your own time. Let's all have fun. Okay, so Simon Sinek uh, famously said, start with why, like that's the, that's the book, right? So you might be asking yourself, why? Why do we want to do 3D on the web? We have game consoles, we have you know TVs, we have so many better things to display 3D. Do we really need to put it in a browser that has you know compatibility issues and different devices and all these things? I do agree that that is a problem, but um, it's making the web pretty cool. Like there are technologies for 3D that are currently available, and they're becoming more and more um, prominent and used. So you can make cool like presentational um, product pages where users can actually do like 3D views of your product and get to know it before they actually buy it. You can do really cool portfolios um, and even interactive storytelling. But okay, that's like flashy fancy. Maybe you're not into that. Um, 3D is also making the web a little bit more useful. So you ha you're having more and more applications that are browser-based because browser-based applications are inherently a bit more accessible to your users because they don't have to download anything, they don't have to like, install a program, um, that, that actually utilize 3D for you know, real world use cases. So we have Tinkercad from Autodesk, um, which is a CAD tool, uh, so technical drawing tool to teach students about technical drawing. Uh, Promaton is a company that's doing um, a tool for dentists to help them make better implants for you so that your teeth can look good and fit your mouth. And um, finally, we have Spline, which is like a 3D Figma, I like to say, that enables collaborative editing of 3D designs. And all of these run on web technologies, and they are being used by real people for real jobs. So a little bit about the narrative structure of this talk. What we just went through was the hook, is the call to action. I hope you're excited and you're ready to follow me on this great adventure. Um, and then, have any of you read uh, Brandon Sanderson? One. Um, this is one of those like fantasy books that has about 80% backstory and like tedious lore that you kind of want to get through, but then it's kind of worth it at the end. So. <laughs> Most of this presentation is that. Uh, we have to go into the historical uh, significance of all of the events that happened before we get to the good stuff. Um, that's the fundamentals of graphics. Then we have to uh, explore the intricate magic system that is WebGL. And once we have all of that knowledge and we understand everything, we get to a really short climax that feels like it should have happened much earlier in this presentation and it should have lasted longer. And that's all of the modern tools that are available to you. And then I finish it off with a nice cliffhanger where I give you resources to go on your way and learn more. Okay, so part one, computer graphics. So what are computer graphics like? 3D computer graphics, it's what this talk is about and it's good to have like a, a concrete definition at the beginning. So we'll take this one from Wikipedia. Uh, 3D computer graphics are graphics that, are that use three-dimensional representations of geometric data Da, 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 for the purposes of uh, performing calculations and rendering digital images, usually 2D images. So what is the, like a three-dimensional representation of geometric data? Like we're developers or programmers, we're already starting to think, how can we represent this stuff in data? Because we know what data is. Data is bytes, data is ones and zeros, and you know, some other structures that we put on top of that. Um, but you know, like I have a 3D object, how does that get stored into ones and zeros? Um, so for that, let's imagine a 3D object. And here I have a, a really cute model of a Shiba Inu that's clearly 3D. Like we can move it around, it, it has a shape to it, it kind of changes uh, with the angle. 
And how does this doggo get uh, stored in memory? That's what we want to answer. So under the hood, it is really geometric data. It's a collection of uh, quads and triangles that make up the shape of it. And where these uh, shapes meet, we have something we call a vertex. So mul uh, multiple ver ver one vertex, multiple vertices. And this type of view we call a wireframe. Now that the dog is a bit complex, like even as a wireframe, it's a bit complicated. Um, so let's start with a cube. Cube is kind of very basic uh, in its form. So we have eight vertices for a cube, one for each of the corners, easy enough. When we connect the vertices in a given order, we end up with something that we would call a cube, right? It has six faces. And the order in which we connect those vertices is important, right? Because there are a lot of different ways. I'm not good at probability, so I can't tell you exactly how many. But there's a lot of different ways you could potentially connect those vertices that would not result in a cube. But when we do do it correctly, we get six faces. And unfortunately, four points that generate like a quad for a face is not a really accurate way of doing that because um, they don't always necessarily create a plane. And we want a plane, like we want a flat-sided cube. Uh, triangles, or rather three points, are a much better way to represent um, a face because three points in space, unless they're overlapping, will always result in a plane. And uh, that's why we often use triangles in 3D graphics. And vertices plus triangles that they create are what we call a mesh or a geometry. So the dog in the previous example wasn't just a wireframe, right? It had like a nice look to it. It looked fluffy, it looked cute. Um, so there's additional information that also gets stored with each vertex and we, we call these attributes. We'll get more into that later, but um, one of the things that gets stored specifically in that previous model was uh, something called texture coordinates. And texture coordinates function like this. If you think about the model as being made out of paper and then you kind of cut it up so that you can unfurl it, unfold it and uh, lay it flat, what you can do then is kind of map it onto like a drawing or a piece of paper if you're thinking uh, like physically. And what that tells you is when you put it back together, um, you can map the value of each specific vertex onto a point on the image, and then you can kind of map that onto the 3D object. So that's texture coordinates, and that also gets stored with the, um, the model data. So now we have like an idea of all the data that needs to go in to um, creating a 3D model. What are the file formats? How, are they, how is this data stored? There's quite a few. Um, there's a lot that are proprietary, for example, FBX or um, USD. There's some that are open standard. So uh, GLTF is the one that's used most often for web development uh, because it is an open standard and it kind of works nicely already with 3JS and the existing libraries. And there is um, this kind of archaic wavefront OBJ format, which is really cool for us when we're trying to understand this because it is text-based. And so what we get to do is look at exactly how this is stored in a file. So this is a cube uh, exported from Blender. And we can see here that uh, each of the, the rows denote a specific letter, um, which is the, the attribute or like what is encoded in that row and then some numbers. So we have here eight vertices, right? For the positions of our corners of the cube. Then we have um, the vertex normals, which are the vectors perpendicular to the face. Uh, basically, if you think of like a plane and then one vector that's kind of going out of it perpendicularly, that's what's defined in a uh, vertex normal. And then we have the texture coordinates. And you may notice there's a lot more texture coordinates than there are actual vertices. And that's because when we cut up, up the, um, the cube and put it flat, wherever we cut, we kind of split the vertex in half. And so we get more than one. S, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> but uh, at the end, we have faces because, of course, it's important how we connect the vertices into faces. And here you can see um, each face has four values, so one for each of the vertices that make it up. And um, of the four values, it's divided into like three chunks. 
where they correspond to the index of whatever entity um, came before it. So the first value is the vertex itself. So this would be this one. It's not zero indexed. Um, like months, I don't know if you know, but months are also not zero indexed. <laughs> and um, the second value is the texture coordinate, and then the third value is the normal. And as you can see, like the first base uh, has the same normal value for each of the vertices, which means that there's only like one direction that's pointing out from that face. Okay, so that's, yeah, and this is what it, what the texture coordinates look like. As you can tell, there is 14 uh, vertices here like there were in the texture coordinates. Okay, so we have our object, we know how it's stored, and we gotta put it somewhere. And this might be super obvious, but um, we use the 3D coordinate system. And the 2D coordinate system we kind of learn in school, um, unless you're doing more advanced math than you probably should be, then it's good for anybody. Um, you do kind of, you know, positive Y is up, uh, positive X is right. And when we add the third dimension, you can add it in quite a surprising many amount of ways. And there's, this is the tab of the spaces of the 3D world, um, is what is up, is it Z? Is it negative Z, is it Y? Um, but for us, for 3JS, we make positive Z uh, come forward. Did the mic stop working? Or is it? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so positive Z comes towards us, negative Z is away from us, and we kind of keep X and Y the, um, the way we're looking at a screen. Okay, so we have, we know some kind of uh, mechanism for putting things in place, and how do we actually get objects uh, into a scene? We don't want everything right in the center, and these are called uh, transformations. Transformations are the fancy mathy part of 3D, um, and the way I like to think about it is if you have like a transformation, like a, a matrix operation, um, which is what it is under the hood, it's all like linear algebra and, and super complicated, for me at least, um, it's just like a function that you plug in a 3D value and it like gives you another 3D value. That, that's all it is. And so you have transformations that are translations basically that will take the value and kind of move it, um, move all the values of your mesh to one end um, kind of without changing the way they're uh, ordered. Another is rotating them and the third is scaling them, so making them bigger or smaller. And you can do this to basically anything, um, anything in your scene, any, any mesh. Cool, we have stuff, we've put it somewhere. Now we gotta look at it. And we do that with a, a concept of a camera, which serves as our eye in the scene. And uh, we figure out what the camera is looking at by its position, so where it's located and kind of its orientation. We configure the camera to figure out how much it can see uh, with the field of view, which is the vertical kind of angle of what it sees. And then um, the aspect ratio to figure out how, like, what is actually the, the scope of what it can see. We also define uh, two concepts called near and far planes to kind of cut off things that are too close to the camera that we don't want to render and cut off things that are way too far and we also don't want to render. Okay, final part um, of kind of the concepts of 3D are light and shadows. So in my mind, this is really what makes 3D 3D because we're, um, like I said, art school dropout. If I'm drawing something and it's not shaded, I, it doesn't look 3D to my mind. So how do we do that with um, in, in computer graphics? There's two ways. Um, one is trying to simulate reality. So doing things, basically trying to do like behaviors that the physical world does. So trying to emulate what a photon would do and how it would bounce off, let's say that chair, for example, and then what it would bounce off onto and so on. Or you can, you know, fake it till you make it, um, which is what we'll do because it's so much easier. And you, for, I mean, <laughs> for the most part, um, it really doesn't matter. Like, yeah. No, I'm just thinking about like all the, the super, uh, fancy graphics games that have that have spent so much uh, on ray tracing and making all these realistic uh, effects, but then they're not actually fun to play. So why does it? Why bother? Um, 
Okay, lighting. We have uh, something called a light source that we put in our scene and it emits light. That's basically it, it's like a light bulb or the sun. We have uh, different types of light sources that we kind of fake and make them uh, behave in a certain way. We have something called ambient light that um, creates the same amount of light for all objects. Directional lights, which is the sun, for example, that uh, emits light directly in, uh, in, per in parallel uh, rays onto everything. And then point lights, which is like a point that emits light um, from the center. And finally, we have uh, concepts of shadows. And shadows make up, come in two parts. So we have the core shadow, which is the shadow that's on the object itself. It's where the object um, prevents light from reaching other areas of itself. And cast shadows, which are uh, shadows that the object casts onto other objects. And um, those two in three are calculated differently. One is kind of uh, on the object itself, and the other one is based on the light and how the light um, projects light into the scene. OK, enough theory. Uh, let's get practical with uh, WebGL. So WebGL stands for uh, Web Graphics Library, and it is an implementation of uh, OpenGL ES2, which allows you, through the browser, to directly communicate with the GPU. And um, it's supported in all modern browsers, with some caveats about like the device's GPU, because it needs to communicate with the GPU. OK. It's cool. We get to do we get to do like GPU things with with WebGL. We get to do 3D. That's cool. How do we use it? Uh, first, we need to get a WebGL rendering context from a canvas element, and then we need to bind data into specific uh, special structures called array buffers and put them to a specific location in the GPU memory. And then we need to write these things called shaders that do matrix operations and position vertices and define specifically the pixel color that we want to show. And if all of this is sounding pretty complicated, um, it is. <laughs> so bear with me. We'll get through this together. Uh, it's going to be OK. I'm going to take a drink of water, and we'll get through it. OK. The WebGL rendering pipeline. Um, basically, the way WebGL works is it requires you to set up all of this stuff up front. You have to initialize WebGL. You have to uh, load in all of the data. And then once the state you have created is all set, you, create, um, you do a render call, or you do uh, draw elements or draw arrays. And that actually sets off WebGL, and it starts doing its thing. It first calls the vertex shader for each of the vertices. So in the uh, cube example, it would be called eight times. The vertex shader is responsible for setting the GL position. So moving in space those vertices wherever they need to go. And it does this by like what, whatever the camera is, if there's a transformation being done on the model, and so on. And it can also pass on variings, which are values that get passed on to the fragment shader, because the fragment shader doesn't know anything about vertices. It only knows about pixels. And this is a way to kind of move that data along. WebGL then takes over and does two things. Uh, first is primitive assembly, where it uh, groups together all of the vertices that we've now you know, moved in space and put wherever they need to be. It groups them into triangles or primitives, whatever, whatever primitive you're using. And then it rasterizes them. So it takes the primitive and turns it into pixels. And at this point, there's also culling and clipping that occur, which is when um, any pixel that's not within our viewport gets culled. So any, any primitive that, that's outside of the viewport, we don't need to think about. And um, anything that's like halfway in, halfway out, gets clipped. So we cut where, um, where it's kind of sticking out. And finally, we have, uh, after the rasterization, we finish with the fragment shader, where for every single um, pixel that we're now, we know we need to render, we have to define a specific color. And we do that with a GL frag color. OK, this is the cube that we'll be doing very quickly, I hope, in plain WebGL. All right, WebGL speed run. First, initializing WebGL. So we need to get the, the context from a canvas element. We need to make sure that 
it exists, and we need to clear the color um, and do a little bit of like setup stuff um, before we get started. Then we need to pass in data. So the cube we saw, you know, it had the, the eight vertices, but it also had different colors for each of the sides. And um, when we pass values that are per vertex, that's called an attribute. And when values are passed that are constant for the entire duration of the render, those are called uniforms. Okay, setting up the attributes. You have to do all this by hand. Uh, you have to say where each pixel or which, where each vertex will be of your cube. So this is basically the same uh, definition of a cube that we had with the, the OBJ file earlier, but we're doing it by hand. So we set that. And then we need to create a buffer for um, this to be loaded onto the GPU. We bind that buffer and then we load in the data. So now we have a, a position buffer with all this data. We do the same with the colors. Um, same thing. And then we define the faces with um, indices. So this is a different type of uh, buffer. It's an element array buffer, but it basically is that last part of the, the OBJ file that says which, um, which pixels belong to which face. Okay, next part is we have to create the shader program. And we do this with uh, sh uh, shaders are like the specific um, program that actually gets run on the GPU. And they're written in a language called GLSL or the Open, uh, OpenGL shading language. And it's a bit like, a, it's a C-like language um, that has some quirks, but we need to load it first, um, create the program and attach these shaders to it. And then uh, link the program. To actually load the shaders, we kind of get the source code, which is just a string and uh, compile it. And if there's any errors in compiling, um, it's, it's very C. Like if you've done C and you have like the linker step and the comp compilation step, it's very much like that. Okay, so we have the two shaders, right? One is the vertex shader and that gets called for every vertex. And here we can have um, the attribute, which is you know, the things that we, we pass in per vertex. So each vertex has a position and each vertex has a color. And um, these are other uniforms that we'll get to a little bit later. And we want to pass the color back to the fragment shader. And this is the fancy math right here. <laughs> you just kind of have to load it in correctly and then um, GLSL takes care of it for you. And we're, yeah, we're setting the, the position basically I'm passing along the color. Okay, and then the fragment shader gets to be really cute and simple and just say, oh, I got a, I got a color. I'm gonna say the GL frag color is that color and I'm done. <laughs> I love, I love the, the, the enthusiasm for a simple fragment shader. Um, okay, so now we, we have all of the stuff right, that we, we need WebGL to render and we just needed to render it. Um, and this is a browser API, so that's pretty cool, um, called request animation frame that will draw, um, it will call whatever function you pass to it before it draws the next three paints. So we use it to kind of create a recursive loop and um, yeah, create a recursive loop and redraw our image uh, for every frame. And we can get to do some stuff before that, make this like draw call that actually draws the thing and uh, request to do that again. Okay, almost there. Another deep breath. <laughs> um, so WebGL has almost everything that it needs uh, to draw the scene, almost. Um, so let's actually draw the scene. Let's go through this draw function. First, we want to clear this, the previous scene because it's a state, right? It, it, it'll keep whatever, we have to be very specific about what it, what it needs to do. So we clear the scene, we set up the camera, right? We're, we're familiar with these terms now. Like we have the field of view, we have the aspect ratio near and far. Um, and then we use an external library to uh, create a projection matrix, which is the, um, the transformation basically of, of how we want to apply our camera and our perspective um, onto the scene. We do transformations directly on the cube 
So for every, because we're rotating it, right, for every um, every frame. Now it's possible to do this with a um, on the vertex shader by passing in the the model transform, um, but you can also do it here. And this is another like look up how to do this or <laughs> use a use a um, a library that takes care of these things for you. But uh, yeah, basically you're creating matrices that are the functions that will convert um, the position of your vertex. Blah blah blah. Moving on. Okay, and I really apologize for this. This is like for me the worst part of, of WebGL and I hate it, but um, we've kind of passed all the things that WebGL needs and we still need to pass along the attributes because we created the buffer, right? We have that special structure, but we need to actually put it in the GPU. <laughs> and the way to do that is um, by first getting the location of that attribute because we have a very specific name for it, right? We're calling it A vertex positions. And if you'll recall, that is the same name we had in the vertex reader. Those have to match. And uh, WebGL will tell us, will match those up if we create the correct location. So we, we request the location for an attribute of that name. Then we have to define, um, if you'll recall, when we created the buffer, it was just a flat out array of just a bunch of numbers. And we just put that in memory. We have to tell WebGL how to interpret that. And so the way to do that is by um, using this, uh, this is actually like loading in the data um, into the GPU. You have to say where the, what the location is, the number of components, which in, in the case of, so this is a position, there's three components, right? X, Y, Z. The first three elements belong together. The next three elements belong together. So we say number of components is three. The type is a float. You know, it's just dealing with memory. It doesn't, it's just a bunch of uh, bytes. It doesn't know what it's, what it's looking at. So we're saying you're looking at a float, first three floats, second three floats, third three floats. Those are your vertices. And then uh, the stride and the offset are kind of, if you're, let's not talk about those. <laughs> they make me unhappy. Um, and finally, we say, please enable this, send this to the, the vertex shader. Okay, and then we finally make the draw call. Can you believe it? We're almost there. Okay, we say we have 36 vertices. They, um, oh, the type. The type is the type of the, the index. And the offset. unhappy, like, realm of unhappiness here. But what we do is we finally say GL draw elements and then we're done. Okay, everyone take a deep breath, please. Inhale, exhale. Thank you. We have our cube. We have our cube. But Jesus, 400 lines? <laughs> and I'm not even counting the comments that I left in there. Um, there's gotta be a better way, right? All right, we're at the climax. This is the big, big reveal. There are modern tools for this, thankfully. Um, and it's because web drill is hard. It's low level, you're, you're communicating directly with the GPU, you're, you're doing these operations. You have to translate bytes into something sensible. Um, but thankfully, you know, a lot of people like 3D and are good at it and are experts <laughs> in a lot of ways. And um, they, there's a whole ecosystem for, for this to make it easier for everybody. So you never have to do WebGL again. Um, there's tools for 3D rendering. There's tools for 2D rendering, if that's your game. There's also game engines and uh, data visualization. So this is just like a really short list of tools that I'm familiar with. Um, there is, this is a link right here to a much longer curated list that I recommend you check out. Again, um, I will have another slide with the URL for this slide, for these slides so you can check it out. Okay, so 3.js is arguably the most uh, popular framework. It is a rendering engine, so it, it kind of enables you to um, write JavaScript code that will be rendered, um, that will simplify doing 3D rendering. And um, it's the one your presenter knows the best, so it's the one we'll be talking about. 
Um, let's do a similar type of, um, of thing with just 3.js. And I promise you this will be a lot quicker. OK, so what we need is a canvas element. Uh, we get from it the height and the width. We create a scene. That's where all our stuff goes. We create a camera. It's one line. That's all we need to do. Um, you know, the, the, this is the field of view. We have the aspect ratio, the near plane, the far plane. And then we position it a little bit away from our scene so we can look at it. We create a render so we don't have to initialize WebGL anymore. It takes care of that for us. And we tell it the size of our canvas. We create a cube with one line, a cube with one line. And um, we give it a material so that 3JS knows how it should interact with light. And then we combine those, uh, the geometry and material into a cube. And we add it to the scene. So our scene has stuff in it now. And finally, we have the um, animate function, which is kind of the same as it was before. Oh no, okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's it, that's 22 lines instead of 400, pretty good. I mean, granted, you do have to use all of 3JS and load that in, and that's you know more than 400 lines, but you can do a lot more stuff with it, right? So let's see what else we can do. Let's, let's do some lighting. Why not? Why not do some lighting? So how we would do that is uh, create two lights. We would do an ambient light, so something that would illuminate the whole scene, and a directional light to kind of um, create cool shadows. That's really the point of it. We need to change the material of the cube, because like I said, the material is um, what tells 3JS how the, the cube needs to uh, react with light. And the one kind of one of the, the main materials that you can use for good lighting is a uh, mesh standard material. And uh, we need to enable shadows so that our renderer knows that it needs to calculate shadows and um, our lights also need to know that they cast shadows and the cube also needs to know that it casts a shadow. Um, and finally, we don't have anything to actually get those shadows. We just have the cube. So let's create a plane, um, another really simple geometry to make. Uh, rotate it so it's facing the right way and put it where it needs to go and tell it that it receives shadows. And uh, yeah, that's it. Simple. OK, so clearly 3JS is orders of magnitude easier than plain WebGL. Like, nobody's disputing that. Um, but <laughs> I see you sneaking in there. <laughs> Um, but what if you want to integrate your 3D things into web applications? What if you um, don't want to write things that are kind of like in an index HTML file and you don't want to do all the scaffolding um, in, in addition? You know, what if you want 3JS to be a bit more frameworky? Well, have I got news for you? <laughs> There's a thing called React Fiber. Um, that allows you to write 3JS, but as if it were React. So you guys who write components, you get to use hooks, and you do 3D. And it's, it's really cool. So let's do just one last code example. Um, bare bones React 3 Fiber cube. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a component. It has, uh, you, you instantiate it with a canvas that takes care of the render, it takes care of the scene, it takes care of a default camera, it does a lot of stuff, and you get to pass props declaratively. Another component is just an ambient light, another component is the directional light, easy peasy. Um, I get to, you know, extract code out, so I have a cube that could potentially be used in other scenes, and I have a mesh for the plane, um, and this is, very closely, like a one-to-one -one mapping of the previous example, um, just declaratively in React. And as for that cube, um, this is what it looks like. So we have this use frame hook, which enables us to uh, hook into, huh, pun intended, um, <laughs> hook into the rendering cycle, and uh, it basically gets called before um, the next render. And we get to manipulate things, and you know they they change in the screen, and yeah, we just have a regular uh, 
box geometry, the same standard uh, mesh standard material, wrap it in a mesh, and uh, create a ref to the mesh so that we get to you at the rotation. And yeah, that's all it took, like two React components and you have a, the 3D scene that takes, with lighting, probably much more than 400 lines in WebGL. Um, but like th this entire presentation is like, but there's more. <laughs> there's additional benefits to using uh, React 3 Fiber and I'm just blown away by their like examples or showcase section on their website. So um, these are two, two things that I really liked um, that I wanted to share with you. So you have really cool post-processing kind of out of the box. Um, and here we have the post-processing of Bloom. So uh, any lighter colors kind of get, um, lo look like they're glowing and uh, depth of field post-processing as well. And uh, yeah, this is all also just like regular regular React code um, that you can more or less interpret even even if you don't know 3D with all of these basics, um, you, you know what's going on. So in this case, we have some lights in the scene. We have uh, post-processing effects as components. And we have some like nice helpers, you know, to, to uh, bake shadows so that they don't have to get recalculated every time. And yeah, that's pretty cool. But what else is cool? HTML inputs. So this demo just blew my mind. Uh, you can have a, an HTML input, like an actual input, you can have a form, you can have your user sign up be in a 3D scene. And that also is just React code. And yeah. I encourage you to uh, go to the React 3 Fiber website. They have examples, showcases. All of this stuff is mind blowing and amazing. Um, so the cliffhanger is, are you ready to learn more? So these are just, I'm gonna go through these very quickly, um, give you some, some of the best hits and you can uh, take the time and look at them yourself. So in terms of like books, tutorials, documentation, um, WebGL Fundamentals is where I got a lot of the the explanations about WebGL that I've given today, as well as the uh, MDN WebGL tutorials. The 3JS documentation is pretty great. Um, it's gotten a lot better. If you wanna learn like deep, in-depth um, OpenGL, which some of it translates to WebGL, the OpenGL wiki is also pretty good. And yeah, React 3 Fiber documentation, as I mentioned a few times. And this book, um, Computer Graphics from Scratch by Gabriel Gambetta is really like a nice uh, overview of just the, the principles of 3D. And he goes in depth into like ray tracing and different lighting models and all this stuff. So check that out if you're a nerd like me and like this stuff. Uh, courses, these are uh, paid courses, but um, 3JS Journey by Bruno Simon is freaking amazing. It is like a masterclass on how you should build an online course. Um, and like everybody's bought it and taken it. And we have so many more 3JS experts now <laughs> because of it, um, but I highly recommend it. Um, there's also a few more that are, um, I'm not sure if the GLSL shader is from scratch, which Dylan might be interesting for you. So we're complaining. <laughs> um, yeah, the, those, are, those two are also um, pretty good. I haven't finished them though. And uh, these other ones are YouTube channels that I would recommend where I learned most of the stuff I know about um, OpenGL and buffers and attributes and all that stuff. Okay. And finally, um, I think the best resource is the, the friends we make along the way. <laughs> um, so I would highly recommend also joining uh, Discord communities if you're interested um, in kind of being part of a community, talking to people, having somebody debug for you, things that are difficult. Um, I've definitely had quite, quite nice experiences on all of these. Um, so yeah. So hopefully I've uh, shown some light, pun intended, on uh, 3D graphics for you and you feel more confident in, in picking up some documentation and trying some 3D scenes yourself. Once again, the slides, uh, take a photo. See some foams going up, so I will, uh, I will awkwardly stand here and wait for you to take take your pictures. 
It's all good. <laughs> I've had a long day. I'm really tired. Okay. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, reach out and uh, yeah, ask me any questions later. Thank you.